Hello, and welcome to One Stop Co-op Shop, your one stop for board game news and reviews. Hold on to your pants, it's time for a special episode. Hey everybody, welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. This is Mike, I'm on my own today, no Peter, Steve, or Elijah. And we are talking to two of my favorite designers in the solo realm, Morton and David, who both work with the Automa Project, or sorry, the Automa Factory, that do a lot of projects. Uh, you might know their work from pretty much every solo mode that Stonemeyer Games has uh, put out. So they worked on the Euphoria solo that was recent. They've worked on the Tapestry solo that's uh, coming and pre-orders have uh, happened recently. They worked on the Scythe solo that I absolutely love. And also uh, other games beyond Stonemeyer. For example, they did the solo on Gaia Project. So uh, David and Morton, thanks so much for being here. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having us. Good to be here. So David's in the same time zone as me. He's, he's, we're recording in the morning. And then uh, Morton, what time is it where you are? It's uh, half past five here in Denmark. Oh, there we go. So, so thanks for making some time over uh, dinner or before dinner for us. So uh, you guys are awesome solo designers. And I heard as we uh, will get into later, you might actually have some co-op coming down the pike as well, which of course makes us happy. But uh, we're going to talk a bit about your history of gaming and then uh, talk some tapestry, talk some of the other uh, games you've designed and just get into some of your kind of solo philosophy and, and how you design games. And I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our Patreon contributors sponsoring this episode. We have Jason, who's a co-op MVP, Derek J., who's a co-op fan, and Jared Orlando, also a co-op fan. So thank you all for your support at Patreon. All right, so, uh, Morton, we can start with you. What's kind of your history as a gamer? How did you first get into this hobby? Yeah, well, just, uh, I should start by saying that the guy with the weird accent is Morton, and the guy who speaks proper English is David, just so listeners can tell us apart. Okay. <laughs> I, I think your English is fully proper. <laughs> well, well, I got started very early uh, when I was a kid with the, the classics, Monopoly, Chess, all the classic card games, played many games that were published only in Denmark and Northern Europe. So you probably won't know it when, if I say Fulrega or Finance or Fangtun. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Fangtun. That was one of my favorites growing up. <laughs> yeah, well, back then, the number of games available in Denmark was very low. And I couldn't read English well enough to buy any games from the one store in Denmark that sold English games. But so I learned later on and got into a merry trash with Space Hulk, Blood Bowl, Star Warriors, and then Catan took me into to Euro games. Yeah, very cool. That actually sounds similar to me. Uh, I was playing like Avalon Hill games and uh, you know Illuminati and those kind of things early on. But then yeah, definitely uh, Catan was the gateway, as I'm sure it was for a lot of people. Uh, David, how about you? Yeah, I I, um, I I obviously played all those mass market games early on, but. I didn't really start to get into gaming until I'm fairly recent, I guess uh, maybe six or seven years ago. My entry point was my son and I were playing video games a lot, and I was looking for an alternative to that. I just felt it was, you know, we were doing it too much. And so, you know, I started uh, looking into board games. I discovered Kickstarter and, uh, you know, started buying games through that. And my son still doesn't play board games, but I got completely hooked and... Uh, so that was that was my way in. <laughs> I love the fact that you did it all for your son. That he's like, "Nah, Dad, I'm gonna keep playing video games. Get out of here." <laughs> yeah, he like he likes that too. <laughs> Finds it very funny. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> So uh, a very separate thing, you both are clearly uh, very big names in solo design now. So how did you get involved with solo design and the Automa Factory specifically? And, and I mean, how did, how did even the idea to have kind of a company focused on this happen? Just uh, I, I guess both of you, however you want to go, tell that story. Yeah, well, I followed Morton in. So Morton, why don't you get started and then I'll, I'll tell everyone how I joined you. Um, sure. Well, I've been designing games since... I was old enough to uh, understand what the game was. Uh, awful games, of course. <laughs> and then I got into solo gaming, something like eight years ago, nine years ago, and started toying around with playing, designing solo games and participated in the 2013 Solicit Print and Play contest. And then I got to know Jamie Stegmaier during his first Kickstarter for Viticulture. 
So, so how did that happen? Because because got to know that that could be anything. Like, were you, were you chatting on the Kickstarter? Like, leaving comments? Had he seen your your print and play work? My interest in the in the game came from the fact that when he launched the Kickstarter, I had just gotten home from uh, Tuscany, where we visited a vineyard. And so when I got home, there was this uh, guy on Kickstarter who was uh, making a game about running a vineyard in Tuscany. <laughs> so uh, I had to check it out and. Back then, it wasn't common to have the rule book available during a Kickstarter, but I asked for it. And then the way my brain is wired, that when I read something, I spot typos and sentences that could be improved. So I wrote to Jamie with uh, all my uh, corrections, and he appreciated it, and I sent him more and more, and we, we got to talking. And then we talked more and more about game design general, books, movies, whatever. And so when... Uh, he was making the Tuscany expansion for Viticulture. It was one of the playtesters who asked him about making a solo mode. And since he's not into solo gaming, but he knew that I was, he asked me to do it. And, uh, well, then I did with some help. Oh, that's so crazy. So, so there you go, everyone listening. Uh, leaving comments on Kickstarter can lead to amazing things. <laughs> And drinking wine in Tuscany can also lead to amazing things. <laughs> yeah, that one I'm a little jealous of. So, <laughs> I won't touch that. so my trajectory was was fairly similar, although I was stalking Morton while he was stalking Jamie. Um, so I, I was doing some print and play. Like I discovered Board Game Geek shortly after I started backing Kickstarters, and um, uh, I was following people. I mean, like. Todd Sanders was one of my early favorite, you know, print and play designers, small designs. And I would just, you know, kind of provide him feedback and whatnot. And I must have been Morton's blog. I actually don't remember. But at some point I found Morton talking about the work he was going to try and do with Tuscany. And I offered myself as a play tester for him. Um, And I started playing testing and kind of similar to him, I couldn't resist making suggestions and he took a couple of them and uh tolerated me and uh over time i made more suggestions or pushed my way in deeper and uh he hasn't been able to shake me since well that's great guys now how did things like clearly that was just one game how did things expand to where you actually have this this company now and you've expanded beyond stonemeyer game so how did uh, things kind of grow from that in this initial uh tuscany viticulture beginning well, it was very much step by step when uh, when we finished the one for OG Culture, we started on one for Euphoria, which then got put on hold. Oh, wow. So Euphoria, even though, I mean, that's a very recent release, but that was one of, that was the second one you started working on? Yep, it was. Um, it got pretty revamped for the final version, but we did, did a lot of work on it after Tuscany, and then we didn't touch it for years. And in the meantime... Jamie then made Scythe and asked us from uh, the beginning this time to uh, whether we could make a solo mode. And so we started working on that. And during the playtest process for, for Scythe, we uh, invited one of the playtesters, uh, Linus Huda, to uh, join the team. And so now he's uh, the third person in the core of the company. And well, basically things went from there, one game after another. I, I gave away the Tuscany Viticulture uh, Automa for free to Jamie off to pay, but it was just a hobby project for me. I thought, I thought it was cool to get it published, so I didn't want any money. But then for the following projects, we started getting money. And so I started a company to receive the payments. And, well, there were more and more projects and started making real money. And uh, last November, I was able to go uh, full-time in Automa Factory. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. That's Thank you. <laughs> clearly a dream of me and, and all the other amateur designers out there yeah well that, that's great it's a privilege to have your hobby as a, as your work now h- how many you said the core are the three of you the core or is uh there anyone else that you would kind of consider like the core workers in the factory well it's a matter of definition but you'd say i insist that we always on every project have someone who's lead um who's in the end, can make the calls without discussion. We'll, of course, dis- discuss, but one person can make the decision. And it depends on the project and the time in the project, who is lead. And so far, it has only been uh, David, Linus, and me who've been taking lead. So I'll define us as the core in that way. And the, they are the guys I talk to the most and invite, so to speak, to all projects. And we have other people who are working with us on some projects, um, Nick Shaw has worked with us on several projects. 
We had Jens Schröder on Gaia and Wingspan, and on Tapestry we had uh, Liev Teugels. And now for an upcoming game, we have uh, the game breaker over them all, Ben Montgomery, joining us because he uh, kept breaking games for us. So I think this guy we've got to have on the team. So yeah, we are a lot of people uh, with, I would define the core as uh, David Linus and me. They also are the ones who influence company decisions. It's, it's interesting. Uh, you all have the exact same process that Peter and I have when we design our games. Uh, we'll take turns. Well, not always take turns, but, you know, whoever kind of has the most passion for a game or whoever uh, has the initial idea for a game, they'll be the lead and they'll make all the ending decisions. How do you feel about the uh, the process of working together, David, especially with you all being in very different time zones? Like, how, how does all of that... Uh, factor in and how does it work out for you yeah time zones are interesting um sometimes it works to our advantage um there's that kind of space between when you send something out and the others have time to kind of respond i like the fact that it controls the flow a little bit but uh um we managed to make it work um you know I'll, i'll often wake up to a flood of emails if linus and and morton or or some of the other contributors have been working overnight um, which is kind of fun, um, a fun thing to do over coffee. But, um, you know, I, I, it's an evolving process. I like the way we hand things off. Uh, you know, it's, it's not always true that one person will take the lead for a project the entire time. Sometimes we'll hand it off at some point, um, which I, I kind of find interesting. You know, we, we, one of us puts in a lot of influence and, and steers it, and then another one comes in and refines it. Um, I, I find, you know, for the most part, we work really well together as far as that's concerned. Well, thank you all for that. Um, I wanted to get into a bit of kind of the design philosophy. So for those who aren't familiar with your automa and how they work, and of course they aren't identical, but I do think there's kind of some overriding things. And Morton, you've written about these on uh, Board Game Geek in some really ga- uh, great blog posts that break down kind of your process and even give examples of how you would work through this. And I'll link to all of those in the uh, the notes for the episode. But uh, c- can you guys kind of talk about what what version of Solo you prefer to design? Like if it's a uh, beat your score solo, if it's like running a full AI solo, where, for those who aren't familiar, does kind of the automa of your games fall in? Yeah, well, I, I prefer the AI system over beat your own high score. And the, the automas, they vary a lot in complexity. Basically, it depends on the need of the game. But we never reach anything like uh, the coin games, their, their complexity so uh, some war gamers would probably think we are making toys for kids. <laughs> While others would say that uh, something like the Scythe Automa um, is complex and it does have a learning curve. Well, I think both of those can be true. I definitely, you know, comparing, for example, the Euphoria Automa to the Scythe Automa, Scythe certainly has a lot more of kind of if-then statements or uh, logic behind what the Automa is doing because of all the map interaction. Whereas Euphoria is pretty much just draw a card and do this <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, so it depends a lot on the game. Because we have this philosophy that we want to mimic the interactions of the game. And so the complexity of the Automa is defined by how complex it is to mimic those interactions. Yeah, to, to that point, uh, one of the things you mentioned in the blogs is that you want to keep the soul of the game and the soul of playing the game, but cut or minimize the less important aspects. Like, uh, again, for those who don't know your games or haven't read these blogs, what's an example of that? Like, what do you mean by the soul of play versus the less important? When I want to capture the soul of a game, I think that the important part is that you as the player play the same game as you do in multiplayer. If you're all of a sudden playing a significantly different game, well, then we've lost the soul of the game. Apart from just playing with the normal rules, it's important that you have the same type of internal state in the game. So we could take Euphoria as an example, where you have a, a vineyard on a player mat, where you build structures, um, and you have your your wines in your cellar and your grapes and stuff like that. And you need to still play with that when you play the solo mode, even though this is a point of the game where you don't really have any interaction with the other player. 
But then, in addition to the stuff you do on your own, you also need to feel the presence of the other player. You need to feel the impact that player has on you. And the other player has an impact on you in the interaction points of the game. So I think that the interaction points are part of the soul of the game. So in uh, VG Culture, which is a worker placement game, a core interaction is action space blocking. So therefore the Atoma places workers on the action spaces. So, so that's what I mean by capturing this, the soul of the game. But there's a bit more to it than that because this is all well and good, but if running the Atoma, which of course the human player has to do everything for the Atoma, and if doing that takes more time than doing the player's own turn, then you're also losing the soul of the game because now you feel like you are playing run the Atoma and not playing Viticulture. And so the multiple parts of the multiple things you need to do to capture the soul, you need to play the same game, you need to mimic the interactions, and you me- need to make the Atoma easy to manage and fast to manage. Just to highlight one thing that, that Morn said, the player always plays the game the way they normally would. We never want to put something in that makes that, that changes anything to the way the player would normally play the game. He's highlighting just the things that make you feel like you're playing against another player. So how does it feel when a player blocks you from something you want to do or takes a card or comes after you? Those are the things that we want the game to feel like when you're playing. You get to play normally and you get to feel what the other player would normally do to you. Yeah, this very philosophy was was really called to mind for me when I played a game that we recently had on the uh, YouTube channel, which is Star Wars Outer Rim. And this is a Fantasy Flight Asmodee game where you're you know, being Han Solo or Lando Calrissian, going around smuggling, bounty hunting, all this fun kind of stuff. And they had a solo mode, which Fantasy Flight is not necessarily known for in a lot of their games. And it worked totally fine, but it, it did sort of strike me that in this game you have to run an entire AI turn which is almost identical to your turn, like has almost all the exact same steps of your steps of your turn. And there were so many times where I'd be doing something and I was like, why do I care about this? In the actual game, I don't need to worry about like how much money you have. So why am I tracking the the Altama's money? Or well not the Altama. <laughs> they didn't call it that, of course. And uh, you know, when, when he's like halfway across the the map for me and I have no way to interact with him in any way, why do I have to keep on moving him? So yeah, it, it sort of struck I, 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 as a player, love Ural's Automas, the, the ones I've played, which is most of them. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the way you design them. Uh, now, you, you all talked about the sort of negatives of the extreme of having to run a, a player and it taking longer to act than actually running your own game. Now, what do you see as the potential issues, or at least the reason you don't like designing games that go the other way and have no AI exists. I mean, I guess you've talked about that you want to still play the same game, but is there anything you see as not as satisfying as just like trying to beat your own score or just trying to beat a clock in a solo game with no AI? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm definitely in the minority, but I enjoy games that are beat your own score. Um, uh, I'm not, I guess I'm not a hugely competitive player. I like the puzzle of a game. And so particularly, and I'm also a huge Euro fan, that's really where my focus is. So I personally enjoy the puzzle and I've got all these bits and pieces and, you know, how can I make them work together, build an engine, whatever the the scope of the game is. But I understand a lot of people want to have someone or something to beat. And, you know, obviously that's what we focus on in the, you know, the Audima you know, design process. That's the focus of what we're trying to accomplish. But I always loved Uwe Rosenberg games where, you know, you set it up and you do the best you can. Now, s- something else I wanted to uh, ask about. So in, I, now I have not played Viticulture, and I know that's your first one, so I can't say which way it goes here. But I know in uh, Scythe, and I think in my little Scythe, and some of your earlier designs, you have a single card for the Automa's actions. But in some of your designs, and I would say more of the recent ones, Tapestry has this, Euphoria has this, Gaia Project has this. You have these uh, cards where you put them together into pairs, and 
the combination forms the Automa's actions, and it almost gives you a little bit of predictability, because, uh, well, I guess some of them discard the pair, but sometimes you have, like, one card of the pair remain, you can see what's on the side of it. So is that sort of a a new paradigm for design that you really enjoy? Is there a reason you're doing that? Or is it more just a game-by-game decision and you could go back to a single card for your next design? Well, we will go back to a single card design in uh, in the next release. It depends on the game. Now, what do you like about that two-card system? What does that do for the games that you have used it for? Uh, sure. I mean, um, it's a it's a natural progression of what we've done. I mean, I, I it, it enables us to do a number of things um, control the amount of uncertainty and that's both in we don't want the automa to be too random and at the same time we've been trying to find new ways to introduce ways for the player to kind of be able to anticipate what the automa is going to do just as you would um, as you're playing against a real player you can look at your opponent's boards and get a sense for where they're going and what they're trying to accomplish. And the two-card system gives you a little bit of a tip as far as what's coming. But more importantly, it lets us control the percentage of the particular actions that we want the Automa to be able to accomplish during a game. Um, it It is now combined with the way we will grow a deck originally. We'll start off with a small deck and then add in more powerful actions, more frequent actions, or something along those lines. We can build it just as a player's uh, game would be. For instance, in Tapestry, you start off with a small deck because early on in Tapestry, I mean, Tapestry has a huge arc where you start off being able to do almost nothing. And by the end of the game, you're doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, on your turn. And so we're able to control that deck by keeping some of the randomness on those support cards and then controlling the amount of actions of a particular type um, by using the action. So it, it really helps us get control over um, uh, over the whole course, the whole arc of the game. Um, but there are some games that don't require it. Um, for instance, Wingspan... I chose not to go that way because the action decision space is much smaller. The interactions are much less frequent. And so it just wasn't necessary. So it's not that we need it, but I certainly think with some of the more uh, complex designs, you're going to find that we're going to stick with the two card system. We really like the control it gives us. You know, I enjoy it too. And uh, yeah, the things you were just saying remind me a lot of uh, Euphoria, which I've been playing quite a lot recently. And like the fact that I can see, oh, they're going to go to the subterranean spots next turn. I don't know exactly which one, but maybe I'll try to jump in there and, you know, get get my die bump so I don't have to rest as frequently. So I, I definitely appreciate that. It gives you a little, a, a slight predictability because just like with the real player, you never quite know what they're going to do, but you can maybe make some guesses. So you all did mention Tapestry. This is probably the big, I mean, this is the, the biggest one that people are excited about right now, the new one. Uh, for those who don't know, the uh, Automa rulebook and the full rulebook are on the uh, Stonemeyer site. I read through them all and this game looks fabulous. So uh, specifically, well, I guess, uh, w- would one of you want to talk a little bit about what Tapestry, what kind of game it is for those? It- it's it's pretty it's pretty big in discussion right now, but in case people haven't heard of it, what sort of game is Tapestry? Yeah, well, it's a Euro civilization game that can be played in less than two hours for a large group of people, or large up to five players, and for a solo you can get down to about an hour. It's a very, very streamlined version of uh of a civ game you can get started in 15 minutes after taking off the shrink basically or less so there's a very short rule book the core is very simple and then the complexity arises from the components which allows you to get into the game quickly and uh, the core of the game are four advancement tracks sort of like if you've played a civilization game on the computer Sid Maya civilization games for example There are these tech trees where you can choose to research one thing and then this could be uh, alphabet and then based on that you could research literacy and then whatever that um, follows after that. And it's a branching tree, but uh, 
James streamlined that into four linear paths, which you then advance down. And then each space you advance into gives you a specific benefit. You pay to go there, and then you get the benefit. So in one way, you could consider this a worker placement game, where instead of there always being the same spaces available, then there's a progression of spaces. Um, so you always have four options, but it changes from turn to turn what those options are as you progress. And don't take the analogy too far because you're not blocking each other, so in that way it's not worker placement. And uh, in addition to those four tracks, you have a map where you explore and do some, uh, some simple warfare. And then there is uh, technology cards you can research. And you have your own empire you're, you're building on player maps. You have your civilization, which is there are four different, sorry, 16 different civilizations. And you get one of them each. Then you have your player maps where you build production buildings to, uh, yeah, to increase your production and income. And then you have your capital where you put various uh, structures with represented by minis and then uh, the more developed your your capital gets the more resources you earn as you build it and you generate victory points from it so uh, yeah i think that was a bit rambling could you uh, perhaps <laughs> streamline my explanation <laughs> a bit david uh yeah well as far as the the tapestry game i find it very unique in the sense that it comes from a very small group of rules um, the, the mechanisms themselves are very simple, but it really, it really ramps up. Um, it, like I said earlier, you start off without being able to do anything your first turn, and it feels like, you know, how are you ever going to get... I mean, the, the board has room for up to 400 points, um, and your first turn, you're getting a dozen. The arc is incredible, um, which was an interesting challenge for, for Automa. Um, you know, trying to trying to mirror that, and um, but it, it's I, I love. It. I mean, I'm having so much fun with it. I mean, I you know, I played it obviously a lot during playtesting, and I just it's it's definitely my kind of game. So um, it's uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how people feel about uh, it. I have one thing to add, an important one, because uh, the game is called Tapestry, and it gets that name for a set of cards called Tapestry cards, which I didn't mention. And basically, you have a number of these, and uh, three times during the course of the play, you play one of them, and it'll sort of set a special rule for you for the next age of your civilization. Uh, so that's where the name tapestry comes in. You have this series of tapestries that describes the history of your civilization and give you, give you special abilities in each age of your civilization. Yeah, and I got to say, personally, from looking at uh, the rules and the components and everything, the, the mix of these very, very different uh, civilization cards and all those tapestry cards and then managing your own board and fighting over resources – or not resources, uh, territory in the, the central board. It just looks like <laughs> – I mean, I am so excited to give it a try. Now, switching to the Automa itself, uh, is there anything new in this Automa, something you had to, uh, to invent that you had not tried before? Yeah, there's one thing. Uh, there's an extra player, or you can call it a quarter of a player extra. So normally what we do is we uh, we make an automa, and uh, then there's an integer number of automas in the game. Uh, there's one, two, three, or whatever. But this time I'd say we have one and a quarter automa. Um, because there's this small one called the Shadow Empire. So basically when we sit down and dis uh, design a game, one of the decisions we make is how many automas should there be in the game. And it depends on the game, because if it's a slow, complex game, then perhaps we could put in either a more complex automa or a few uh, simpler ones. Uh, but it depends on how uh, complex the automa needs to be. So in something like Scythe, which is fairly complex, we could only have one. While in Charterstone, where the automa needs to doesn't need any complexity at all, basically. We could have multiple, so in that game you can play with any number, up to uh, no humans and six automas. So for Tapestry, there's uh, one complex part of the game in relation to uh, 
to the automa, and that's the warfare on the board. And that requires a bit of complexity, not, not on the level of scythe, but then uh, Tapestry is a very fast-moving game, so we can't really have the players stop and spend a lot of time doing warfare for the automa. So if we had to pull it, put in multiple automas that could then do warfare one after the other, it would get too slow. So we could only have one automa. But then during the development, we uh, realized that, well, it might be that the warfare aspect is complex. Well, it's, compared to a lot of games, it's a very simple, simplified system for, uh, for conquest. Um, but it, it does require some automa rules. But the rest of the game... Uh, is extremely simple and fast. We have these four advancement tracks, and they're basically the core interaction point of the game, racing up those tracks. And the Atoma rules for that part of the game are very simple. They just take a few seconds to carry out a turn for the Atoma. So it occurs to us that, well, we could actually have two Atomas on the tracks and one on the map doing a warfare. So we uh, made a very, very slim down micro automa that played by the same rules as the automa for advancing on the tracks but did nothing else and we call that the shadow empire and uh, so that that's new in a tapestry that we have this uh, micro automa playing along with the full automa i mean it's, it's going back to that philosophy of kind of creating the best uh, interaction points between the automa and the player but you're literally only doing it where the interaction matters more so that's great Exactly, and, and you can take this Shadow Empire and use it in two-player if you want to. Completely optional, but you can use it in, in two-player if you want a little bit more competition on the on the tracks. You know, it's one of those, I, I see it as a natural evolution of the kind of work we've been doing from early on. One of the first pl uh, questions that players will, will give us is, well, can we play with two Automa? Can we play with three? That part early on was never designed into it. But then we would tweak it and say, you know, put it out there and say, all right, well, you can do it this way and that way. And, and we've gotten to the point where we're always thinking that through now. And, you know, the sweet spot it, uh, uh, informs where we ultimately place the rules. But it's certainly something that we always consider now. And I, I think the fact that, you know, Morton and his team, instead of doing two full ones, you know, just took the second one and distilled it down to just the thing that would have the most impact is kind of a next step where we're not only choosing with you know how many but can they be different can one of them just be highly um simplified and just provide a little bit extra to the to the gameplay now something you said david goes right into my next uh, kind of discussion topic i this, <laughs> this might be very personal to me but especially now that I've been doing only solo and co-op almost exclusively. When I play competitive games now, <laughs> I feel a little weird emotionally because whereas I can rejoice with everybody in a co-op game or feel very self-satisfied in a solo game, if I get too happy when I'm winning in a competitive game, I feel like I'm being a jerk <laughs> to the people <laughs> I'm playing with. Um, and so something I've been really enjoying in some games recently is uh, when it's a competitive game and it has not only a solo option, but a way like you were just talking about of including extra Automa and, or, you know, AI or whatever, and playing more than one player against the AI. Um, an example of this is uh root. They have, uh, and I, I would say this seems fairly influenced by you all, but uh, Root has their Better Brot project that's become an official AI kind of solo and co-op variant that's coming out with the next expansion. Uh, you all in My Little Scythe um, had a co-op mode on that. In Rise of Fenris for the main Scythe game, you said it wasn't fully endorsed because you hadn't had a chance to test it, <laughs> but you officially said that it was okay to play with uh, Automa versus... Uh, human players who are working together and they, I think, I think you had them like average their scores and the average human score has to beat the average AI score. So I'm really excited by all that kind of stuff. Uh, what do you think about this idea of working together as a team in a game that was originally competitive to kind of overcome one or more AIs? Yeah, well, I, I love the idea of getting more value from your game. Uh, and I know it's much easier for, to get my family to play a game if, uh, if we win and lose together, oh, I I agree. I mean, uh, 
it's not something that I've, I've worked a lot in. Um, most of the cooperative work that we've done in our projects has been done either by, you know, one of our, our supporting designers or Morton himself. I know it's one of the things that I've been thinking about for Wingspan, where I didn't, this probably goes to what, what you were saying with, uh, you know, family and whatnot. I, I think that game can be played by a younger group in particular if it becomes the family against Automa. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's definitely a place for it. It's, it's another thing that we often will get asked about. Um, a lot of times in the project, a, an idea for it will become uh, apparent and it'll be like, hey, could we do this? Often our deadlines don't allow us to take it to full fruition. Like you were saying, you know, it wasn't fully tested, um, but I, I love the idea. Yeah, and I think the nice thing is, even if you all don't get a chance to fully uh, play test it, it's not like an official version. A lot of the games seem like you could just kind of slot it in. Like I was struck, again, I've been playing Euphoria with the expansion a lot recently. And I said to myself, oh, why couldn't I just play with two players and we have to both reach 10 stars before the Automa reaches 10 stars, which in a way would actually be harder than the current solo mode, because although we could help each other out to make sure that both of our our ducks line up in a row before <laughs> the Otava, you know, crushes through their 10 stars would be kind of tough. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I think a lot of your games, we could just potentially just do it, you know, and it might not work perfect, but that's what all these crazy solo variant designers on uh, and co-op variant designers online like anyway, right? Yeah, in general, you could do it. Yeah, I agree with most of our games, turn them into co-ops. Well, that makes us happy, of course. <laughs> I'd say uh, patchwork would be hard to turn into a uh, co-op since it's a two-player game. Well, yes, good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you would just always win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of co-ops, I know, uh, Morton, you've mentioned to me that you all are in early design of... Because I think everything else you've done so far has been a solo variant for an existing game or, you know, a solo variant developed in cooperation as the main game is being developed. But you all have your own co-op game in the works. Do you want to share any? I mean, not not too many details, I guess. You want to keep things under wraps. But are there any details, details you can share about that? Yeah, I'll start by derailing you a little bit because uh, we actually have one publication that's not a solo mode, and uh, that's an expansion for Hostage Negotiator. Uh, I did an abductor pack for, for that game. You know what, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, I did have that one. And, and well, I mean, uh, AJ, who designed Hostage Negotiator, he published our first design, Salvation Road. And, and my, wife did, uh, <laughs> my wife did illustration for, I think, two of the uh, expansions for Hostage Negotiator. So I should have remembered that one. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, I was going to tell you about, <laughs> about that connection, yeah. But anyways... Other than that, you are completely right. And we are working on a one-to-four-player co-op game on our own. Basically, it goes back to this first solo game I made in the 2013 Solitaire Print and Play contest. And I've always wanted to re-implement that. And then one day I got the idea to do it with uh, some of the mechanisms from one of my favorite games, Onirim. So uh, this pattern building thing from Onirim, we, we took that and extended it. So when you near them, you get cards into your hand, then in the current iteration of a game, you trigger an effect, normally negative, when you get it into a hand, and then you can either use it to form your pattern, or you can play it to give a, get a benefit. And while you're making these patterns, then you, are, you have a physical representation, contrary to near them. There's this forest, a circular forest, where you are being hunted by a monster called the Shadow. And he's casting curses to stop you, and you need to ex escape by forming these magical patterns. And so, as the game goes, you can sacrifice trees in the forest to uh, remove bad effects, but that also means that the forest becomes smaller, so the, uh, it gets tenser as this monster, the shadow, runs after you in an increasingly smaller forest. And at the same time, you'll be pulling cards out of the deck will be pulling good cards out of the deck, but the bad cards um, will remain almost constant, and you reshuffle it every once in a while. So that means you'll get more and more bad cards as the game progresses, and the area you are confined to gets smaller and smaller. So the idea here is to co create uh, this increasing tension during the game. 
Oh my gosh! See, the real the real monster here is is Morton. He loves to torture players, as I've I said earlier. My, my my oh my gosh to explain is pretty much all you had to say was I'm doing a co op version that is you know someone inspired by Onirim, and I was already in. And then you were like, hey, Onirim with a board, and I was more in. And then you have a cool theme, and then I was more in. And then you uh. <laughs> And then you have resource management, which is like my favorite thing in games. And then you have the forest going away. And if you all have ever heard me talk about Forbidden Island, the reason I love Forbidden Island is because of the increasing tension of like the things going away there. So, yeah, uh, you, you like just hit 100% mic excitement level, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if we can live up to that. But it, just to be clear, it's not a board game. It's cards and meebles only. Oh, well, sure, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I don't care if there's a board. I just love the idea. <laughs> We're getting a little long. I don't want to take you guys away from your days too much longer. Let's just end with a little bit of fun. Um, So let's go through a few favorites. Uh, First one, and you can both answer, uh, what's a favorite solo variant? So a game that was not originally solo that has a variant that you did not design. The one designer who does a great job with with products that are kind of similar to what we do is Shem Phillips. Um, I love what he has done. Uh, with his deck of cards for Raiders, uh, amongst other ones. Um, I keep trying to hire him for Automa Factory, but he seems too uh, too busy. But I think he does a great job. And then, I mean, the, the other ones I, that I really like are the scenario-based ones, um, like Reiner Stockhauser did for um, Orléans, and um, Alexander Pfister, uh, what he did with Royal Goods. Uh, you know, taking a very basic resource management card game and then giving it a story and uh, challenges to overcome. I, I like I like a scenario based solo design. Very cool. How about you, Morton? I'll mention the baseball highlights because I really like the the solo variant in that it's an AI, so uh, I'm bound to like it. And I think that Mike Fitzgerald, who made the game, managed to get this uh, AI very smooth. And easy to run. I've made my own tweaks to it also, but... <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that. <laughs> it's my favorite solo variant, and I made it better. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I just tweaked it. I like tweaking things. I've, I make uh, solo variants for other games that have solo variants already. I f- have fun doing that. And whether I make it better or not is another matter. Another example would be uh, at the gates of Lo Yang. It's, it has parts of an AI. You could say it has parts of representations of another player but I, I think the game is awesome um, and I think it's the best of uh, Uwe Rosenberg's solo implementations because it's the one I think that goes closest to simulating the the impact of another player and then uh, sort of related what is a favorite co-op game for each of you maybe one you're playing recently David oh, me first um, co-op oh I like um, Seventh Continent I, I, I would love to um, just spend two weeks just playing solo, <laughs> you know, play, playing uh, uh, Seventh Continent. I, I just love what they did, and um, it's, it's a miraculous design. But, but do you want to play it co-op or solo? <laughs> um, no, co-op. Well, he asked about co-op. So, uh, you know, I, it'll either be uh, you know, a group of friends or a group of friends in my head. But either way, I, I just... I, <laughs> It's a phenomenal product. No, I, I totally agree. I've, I've almost only played that one solo, but I would love if like my wife and I just got a week off of work and could actually sit down and dig into like a two-player game of it. How about you, Morton? Well, I'll uh, pick Spirit Island because that's the one I played most recently co-op and because I know you guys like it. Uh, I only played it once. Did, did you like it too? Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> One of the best game experiences I've had. It was awesome. It was a four-player game. And I actually have it on the table now because I have some time today, so I wanted to try to play it solo also. But it was awesome as a, as a co-op game, but only I only played it once. So I would also like to men- mention Pandemic the Cure, which I've played more as a co-op game and as a solo game, and I really like that. I have not tried it yet. Well, there you go, David. When, when, when we get together <laughs> yep, <laughs> at some point, absolutely. we can definitely try it out. I'm already making plans. I'll teach you that one <laughs> in a minute. Awesome. <laughs> All right, and, and uh, finally, uh, we had a few questions straight from our Slack members. Uh, they wanted to know how big your game of how big your game collection is right now, if you have a general estimate, and uh, what your biggest game of shame is right now. So, a game that you own but have not played yet. Oh boy, 
<laughs> All right, I'm not giving. I'm not giving the size of my collection. Um, it's large. Uh, it's insane, actually. And along with that, the the uh, the shelf of shame is equally embarrassing. Um, I couldn't pick a sing, you know, a, pr- a particular game that that uh, I should pull off first. But there are plenty of of good ones there that um, need to get played. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us are in the same boat. How about you, Morton? Any any game that you own but you feel embarrassed a little bit that you have not played yet? Yeah, well, I'm going to pick one that uh, you're going to kill me now. Um, Arkham Horror, living card game. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys love it. Um, I mean, no, I, I, I don't like that game at all. That's, that's not my number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I... I end up buying too much of it and then I started sleeving and sorting the card and then I realized I didn't know how to sort them and now it's just a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, you know, that's a real phenomenon. I think we need to have a whole episode on um, because that happens all the time with me, especially with Kickstarters. The phenomena of getting so much content all at once that you feel intimidated to start actually playing it. You know, like these big miniature games where you get like five boxes of things and you're like, well, I can't even Open the first box. I just, I'm just going to look at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, uh, final question. Oh, this one's straight from, I think it was Jan on the Slack. Uh, <laughs> he said, will you ever design a variant for Star Wars Rebellion or for War of the Ring? <laughs> because he really likes those games. And I, I think there is, uh, there's a few solo variants for Star Wars Rebellion at least, but I guess they aren't, uh, for him at least, aren't up to the Automa Factory uh, <laughs> pinnacle. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I have not. I have nothing, Morton. You got to go with this one because, uh, as I've said, I'm I'm a Euro boy. So, yeah, I haven't tried either of them. So, uh, <laughs> but there we go. I think that the way we do things works for Euro games, not for Mary Trash. Um, if I may use that term. So if so, if it's not a Euro game, there's a good chance we are not the right team for the job. At least we would need to change our approach. Um, if if it's not euro like when when you look at you know some of the more challenging bits of our our projects like uh scythe and moving around on a board uh unfortunately those kinds of things become even more prominent in in some of the games that you're thinking about um and sure, that sure. it becomes more difficult to to handle and more complex and well that that, that was a very nice Serious answer to a somewhat silly question. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Well, well, I did one for uh, the mind recently. If we want to get silly, <laughs> wait, wait, you, what? <laughs> what? Okay, t- 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 c- can you summarize your solo variant for the mind? <laughs> Awful. <laughs> <laughs> that's. I guess that's all we need to hear. Awesome. <laughs> So, uh, guys, it's been awesome talking to you. Thanks for making some time for us. And, uh, yeah, thanks for the great design work you do. I'm looking forward uh, very much to trying out Tapestry on the Otama there. I need to go back and try out uh, Wingspan and Viticulture. Wingspan, I got to track down a copy at some point. And, yeah, w- whenever you have your uh, your amazing-sounding co-op game ready for uh, some open testing, I'd love to take a crack at it. Uh, we'd love to talk with you again sometime. Thank you very much for having us on. I I think I've told you this, but uh, I love your podcast. It's together with Logology. It uh, goes to the top of my queue whenever it uh, arrives in my podcast feed. Yeah, I, I I really appreciate that. I mean, it's uh, awesome. Whenever we hear from a designer that our podcast is useful and not just people who like reviews, because we do all these design discussion things at the end, and I'm glad that uh, they they are useful or you know at least interesting listening. So thank you so much for saying that. Uh, that's one of the things that really set you apart to me. That I learn a lot about game design that I don't do from a lot of other uh, reviews because you you end with this uh, the the top five system you you do is focused on on the design and the design discussions you do afterwards. I I tend to learn a lot from that. Well, I tend to learn a lot from looking at your guys' Otama. (laughs) (laughs) It goes both ways, but thank you. All right, so that'll do it for another episode of One Stop Co-op Shop. Uh, David and Morton, thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next stop. Thanks for listening to another episode of the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. Please check out our YouTube channel at One Stop Co-op Shop. If you want to reach out to us, the best place to talk to us all is on the Slack. See the show notes for details. Also, you can support us on Patreon 
check out patreon.com slash one stop. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week with another Top 5 list. Thank you.